Hi, and welcome to The Fitness Doctor, the program where we address your exercise, nutrition, and overall health needs. And now, an exercise physiologist in the Department of the Sports Sciences at Wingate University, the man of the hour, the fitness doctor himself, Dr. John Aquaviva. Thanks, Troy. Today on our topic, this segment is high-intensity training, also known as high-intensity interval training, or sometimes referred to as as the acronym HIT. We'll be discussing its sudden rise in popularity, its advantages, and hopefully hear from those who participate in this form of exercise. Troy, what's in store for us today? All right, Doc. Great show as always. Show rundown, special in-studio guests. John Ware, we got the Q&A with Dr. Ray, the Social Media Breakdown, and the Research Minute. All right, let's get to it. My special guest today is John Ware, a fellow exercise physiologist, personal trainer, and fitness club owner from Richmond, Virginia. John, welcome and thanks for being here. Yeah, good to see you. It's a quick five-hour drive, wasn't it? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome that you're here. And now for the topic of the day, a little more on HIT. For those not familiar with it, let's provide a brief overview First, you may know it through its brand names such as CrossFit, T25, P90X, and Insanity. While not the same, they do share the same characteristics, folks. High-intensity exercise, combining cardio and resistance training, sometimes only using your own body weight. Some of these workouts are as short as 15 or 16 minutes long or as much as 40 minutes. Now, here's the big question. Why are they popular? Folks, it's because they work. That's right, Doc. This place is no joke. High intensity training to say the least. Let's just take a look up at the warm up schedule right quick. 50 double unders, 20 sit ups, 20 push ups, 10 gobble squats, 10 pass throughs, 25 pull aparts, 10 15 ring rows, KBs, power presses, just to start it off. You don't get bored. You've got your programming done for you. ease into it a couple times a week you know you don't we don't you don't want to jump in head first blindly because you'll injure yourself but as you get better which happens very quickly um we've got you know, four or five times a week and you have to listen to your own body just like sharon was saying it's real competitive here and really enticing so i think i'm gonna have to try it for myself see you right back let's do it being here with my wife and working out together and and pushing ourselves but I think probably the best thing about CrossFit in general is community behind it you know. Here at CrossFit on Row it is no joke you guys got to come check it out great workout great people. I want to thank Sherrod and Greg for having us here at CrossFit of Monroe, but it's time to send it back to the studio, to the doc, for the quick Q&A. And right now, the first question is, doc, what is the best hit exercise? That's a good question. However, it can't be answered. Uh, these are different programs, and they all offer the same thing in that they are high intensity, but it, it is too much of a, a moving target to say one is best. You'd have to compare one workout to the next. But ultimately, they all bring the results, as we talked about earlier. All right. Question number two. Any concerns about HIT? There's a couple concerns about HIT. Uh, first of all, because of it, the very nature of it, high intensity, uh, people are a little more likely to get hurt because they're doing some true high intensity training, not only just with their own body weight, but they're doing some power exercises like squatting, uh, push presses, and so forth. And they're moving quickly from station to station. And sometimes because fatigue sets in, more likelihood for injury. All right, question number three. What ages are appropriate for HIT? I would say everybody. Uh, it, it depends on, again, what they're doing in that HIT program. But uh, certainly the higher the intensity, the more I think it would be for appropriate age, like maybe late teens to maybe 40 or 50. But I think as long as you get a clearance from a doctor and it's appropriate for the person's age and experience, I think it's fine. Cool. That was the quick QA of the day. Now. Back to the doc. All right, let's talk about uh, high-intensity training in general. Uh, John, you can help me with this list of things. Uh, uh, Let's talk about why it's good. Uh, Caloric expenditure is high. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. There's uh, there's a lot of volume of exercise going on in a very short amount of time. Um, Yeah, so uh, it's it's a great calorie burner for sure. And and I think it's going to bring a great deal of strength. So the people looking for not just to burn calories during the workout, but – to improve their strength as well and to improve bone density. Um, speak to specifically why it's going to improve their strength. 
Well, there's a, there's a heavy functional component to uh, a lot of these high intensity things. So everything that you do fitness related is sort of connected to the ground, which means it can transfer over to your life or to your sport or whatever. Hence the term doing. functional, right? That's Absolutely, what. Absolutely. Yep. Connects it to the ground. So that's uh, that's a big value because you can you know you can use it in every part of your life. It's it's easy to to, to see the kind of value. transfer. Sure. And and help me with some of the exercise they may do now. This is truly a a endless list of exercises. Absolutely, they all have their own unique sort of names that they refer to the movements, um, some obviously better than others, but yeah, there's a lot of them out there. Let's, let's talk about, I think this will really paint the picture well if we say, if we give an example of a particular workout, like for instance, this is what is known as the workout of the day within the CrossFit program. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them was, I remember they did uh, two box jumps and then they did two pull-ups, three box jumps and then three pull-ups. Four box jumps, box jumps maybe 12, 16 inches off the ground. And after they did two, three, and four of those each, they would just literally run 100, uh, 400 meters actually, they come back and they'd go through the same sequence again. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that's just an example. Now, this is their own body weight is the resistance, but a lot of them are station based where they would just move quickly from one uh, exercise to the next. And what would be some of those other exercises that would be in there? All, all calisthenic based, uh, and, and that's primarily because they want to move people through them real quickly. So they don't want to have a lot of equipment to have to sort of adjust. So when you look at a, like a CrossFit program, it's going to be real basic stuff like medicine balls and, and pull up bars and that kind of thing, because they're trying to they're kind of trying to keep things moving as quickly as possible. Now, uh, one of the uh, drawbacks to it. Let's talk a little bit about some of the concerns. First yeah. of all, even people that work out on a regular basis. They, they experience a great deal of soreness. And, and sure. we could argue that it is both a good thing and a bad thing to have muscle soreness. Yeah, there's a tripping point. Um, you know, it, it, the, look, they all are good and, and they all have drawbacks. But um, the, the thing that sort of works against them a lot of times is that there's sort of like a, there's a heavy social component to these. So you're in a sort of a, a group, which some would call a gang. And when you're trying to keep up with that gang of people, you kind of you kind of move yourself out of your own comfort zone. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's bad. So, um, you know, you have to you have to be able to sort of regulate, self-regulate without letting the, the gang influence you. That no, no, that's a great point. In fact, clearly one of the strengths of the CrossFit program and a lot of these other programs, there's the social component. So people have other people and in fact, it's a behavior change strategy known as helping relationships. If you have a, a person or other people to work out with, it just improves your motivation and sure. improves your desire to be there and stay there and so forth. Sure, there's nothing magical about any of the exercises. They're, they've been around for hundreds of years, and neither is there anything magical about it. interval training because that's, that's essentially right. what it is. That's right. What is different now is that you have a group of people who will support you prom- and facilitate the exercise, and, and that's a pretty powerful motivator. You know, that's what that's what gets results a lot of times. Now, a part of our concern is that, it, especially on some of the workouts, and, and, and including some specific exercises, like for instance squatting, push presses, uh, or or some of the weight training exercises that involve other than the human, other than the body as the resistance, some coaching needs to be done. That, Absolutely. That, that that is one of the bigger problems. I mean, you have um, you have exercises that are happening that are designed to improve uh, a person's power. Um, and oftentimes those exercises are meant to be done in small volumes because that's just the nature of the exercise. And when you, when you put it into a, a circuit-based format where the volume goes up and the repetitions go up, now you're kind of you're putting an animal in a different sort of a cage and, uh, and that's when injuries happen. Sure. So pushing, a little, pushing that movement pattern beyond what the body's capable of. Now, let me ask you, uh, you know, you own this personal training studio in Richmond. You've been doing this for a long time. There, there has to be some of your clients. Now, you work with the average client for how many days a week? Two. I Two days a week. Average. So you're encouraging them, and in most cases, they are working out outside of those workouts. Yeah. Some people are probably involving themselves in one way or another in high-intensity training. Sure. And do they come to you with questions, or do they come to you with comments, or do you have discussions with them about this? Yeah, I mean, I think— after a while, you become uh, sort of a trusted part of their team. And so when they have issues, they, they come to you pretty early on. And, and that's the uh, relationship any trainer is looking for is that they, that they trust you enough to ask your opinion. And so, yeah, I guide people a lot when it comes to the, what we call the carryover training or the stuff that they do on their own, the independent sure, stuff. Sure. Now, now, the question during the quick Q&A 
the first one was uh, when producer Troy, uh, he shot out uh, quickly T25, Insanity, CrossFit, and so forth. Um, what, what would you say if somebody said, John, which one should I do? I would say my advice would be do what you can stick to. I mean, yeah. I think it's important that you get real familiar with the movements and try them under your own uh, pace uh, and see how it, it, uh, it impacts your body. And then, because it, it, it can get out of hand pretty quickly. I mean, I know a lot of people who've done a lot of these videos and you want to keep up with it and you kind of ignore your own body's signals. That's right. So you want to kind of, you know, just get a little taste of it and, and see if it, uh, if it agrees with you. Is this uh, fair enough that the... Uh, high intensity training in a way is workouts gone wild, <laughs> yeah. right? Because yeah, they, they haven't, they haven't corralled it. They have a lot of people haven't corralled it. And there's a whole lot of people maybe not coming back, not necessarily because they're so busy, but because they can't walk the next day. Right. <laughs> plus, plus the fact that when you, when you're fatigued during a, like a circuit based training program, your form changes because sure. your body's kind of seeking whatever way it can to do the exercise. And oftentimes it's not a safe way. So without realizing it, it becomes unsafe. Got yeah. It. yeah. What do we got, Troy? Doc, this just in a tweet from James Wells one. His question is: Is hit for beginners? Uh, again, I think it needs to be defined. Uh, first of all, what a beginner is, and second of all, um, what program is going to be involved in that? I, I would say, yeah. Again, as long as the individual that's overseeing that um, directs them. In, in a couple of ways. First of all, that there's progression, but it's slow progression. And then that everything that is done within that program is done according to their experience and their fitness level. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you need to incorporate what their goals are, too. I mean, that's sort of the first step is, 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 is that program going to give you what you need in terms of goals? Yeah, exactly. Because it, be, it could be something less destructive that could give you. The, same, know, the benefit that you want. Without. Yeah, the same result. In fact, this this is why people have gravitated to it so much is simply because they hear other people say, this darn thing right. works. If it's good for them, it must be good for me kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, that, that doesn't always work out right. Okay. All right. Um, we hear from somebody else, Troy. Yep, another one in. Just ran through our email real quick. And this from Michelle in Indian Trail. Her question is, why is CrossFit so popular? CrossFit in particular, it yes. sounds, yeah. Um that that is, um, I think it's a multi multifaceted uh, response. I think the first thing is what we just talked about. It works, right? People are walking around the streets and they're this darn thing works. This, you know, I'm in the best shape of my life. Uh, I've never been more fit. I've, I've never eaten so much food and not gained weight type thing. Um, I, I think that's one reason. But the social component, you cannot yeah, deny. Huge. You can't. That's the biggest part of this. And plus, you have to you have to kind of look at uh, at the how it developed um, at some point in its history early on. Reebok jumped on board and they they got a really good sponsor and reebok's been pushing and pushing so now it's sort of legitimized it as a as a good work oh yeah absolutely as soon as you got a sponsor like that yeah absolutely all right doc it's now time for the research minute all right this is a segment of the show where we take some research that has been conducted uh, preferably in the last couple years that is uh where what they studied was exactly what we're talking about this particular one came out of the journal the physical educator and it was the effect of um, fitness programs in college students. And what they did is they took traditional resistance training programs and they compared fitness parameters, uh, a bunch of them like push-ups and sit-ups, 60-second period, and other uh, cardiorespiratory uh, parameters, and then they compared it to high-intensity training. And in particular, in this study, they used CrossFit workouts of the day. The most interesting thing was they found that uh, – there was no real difference. In fact, some of the parameters, some of these fitness parameters were actually better uh, in the traditional weight training program than they were in the CrossFit program. So while you have to kind of take a really good look at exactly what they did, um, it shows that traditional weight training is as good in some cases, maybe even better. But they went on to say, in fact, they ended the uh, study with saying, but they are both clear uh, ways to improve your overall fitness. So at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to take a break and we'll be right back with our guest, uh, uh, John Ware and uh, more of the fitness doctor right after this message. Your extraordinary future begins at Wingate University with more than 35 undergraduate majors and graduate and professional programs in the health sciences, business, and education. Major in a great life at Wingate University. 
Hi, and welcome back to The Fitness Doctor, the program where we address your exercise, nutrition, and overall health needs. I am John Aquaviva, exercise physiologist in the Department of Sports Sciences at Wingate University. If you're just tuning in, this is the second half of our show. You're listening to ESPN Radio, 730 Charlotte. Uh, I want to welcome again John Ware, fellow exercise physiologist. John, you ready to go for this half? I'm set. I'm ready. Troy, what do we got for this segment? All right, Doc, show rundown once again. Special guest John Ware is still in the building. And then we have the quick Q&A with Dr. A, followed by the social media breakdown, and then the research minute. Okay, let's get to it. Uh, The topic for this segment is sports-related supplements. We know a lot of our listeners are uh, athletes, former athletes, (laughs) recreational athletes. They they weight train. They play flag football on Sundays. A couple days a week, they're in soccer. But they've been taken by a lot of the supplements that are out there, primarily through places like GNC. And they're wondering, is this stuff really good for me? Is this stuff really improve athletic performance? Uh, we're going to be focusing primarily on the legal ones, such <laughs> as like uh, soy versus whey protein, amino acids, a, a relatively new product, muscle milk. And it, we'll even talk about like vitamins and minerals. Uh, but before we go on, Troy, give us the social media info. Yeah, if you guys have uh, questions regarding today's topic, which would be supplements or any other qu- health questions, feel free to request us. On Twitter, that's at WU Fitness Doctor, or be sure to check out our page on Facebook, WU Fitness Doctor. And as always, you can feel free to re- email us at WooFitnessDoctor at Wingate.edu. All right, that bell is the trigger, and now a segment of the show, my favorite part of the day, called the Quick Q&A with Dr. A. So where I get to shoot a couple questions at the doc, pick his brain apart for a little bit. All right, doc, you ready? I'm ready. All right, number one. Why isn't creatine banned by the NCAA and pro sports? Yeah, creatine is certainly one of the bigger supplements over the past few years. Uh, The reason it's not banned is that virtually every study has showed that it doesn't have any long-term negative effects. In fact, even the short-term effects, uh, which uh, do exist, are are minimal, uh, are considered minor issues. And when the human body isn't uh, isn't, uh, hurt, harmed in some way, generally the NCAA and pro sports leave it alone. Awesome. Question number two. For weight trainers and athletes, is more protein better? This is, uh, I would say, a myth, right? Absolutely. If uh, some protein is good, uh, more protein must be better. And here's what we do know about it. Certain amount of protein is needed. In fact, if there's a shortage of protein intake, then, for instance, a weight training program is not going to respond as well as if there's enough. But more is not necessarily better. In fact, uh, a lot of people actually know this this, uh, protein. Side note, and that is protein that is not used by the body actually can uh, literally turn into stored body fat. So we have to be careful with that. And there's only a small percentage. In fact, most research says that any more than around 20% of your total intake of calories from protein, uh, then, then the uh, body will convert that excess protein into fat. All right, question number three. Should HGH and steroids be banned from the NCAA and pro sports? Yes. <laughs> quick one answer. There quick it is. Answer. That's the quick Q&A of the day. And back to the doc. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's, we, uh, we mentioned in the quick Q&A uh, creatine. Uh, sometimes it's known as creatine monohydrate, uh, sometimes known as creatine phosphate. And this is a little background on this, a little exercise physiology, actually. This is uh, a, a compound that's naturally found in the muscle. And it, it, it's what um, helps create what's called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Now, the reason that ATP is so important and everybody out there right now is going, ATP, I remember those three initials from biology class in high school or, or college. But, yeah, that, that's a good memory on your part because uh, it's the only type of energy that the muscle recognizes. So if you don't create ATP, the muscle can't go through any type of contraction. Creatine actually helps create ATP. In fact, there's a direct relationship between the two. And this is... Uh, something that is relatively new, and, and ultimately what they did is they extracted it from meat products and then made it into a powder form. In fact, if you if you were to open up, if, if you were to go to a, a general uh, nutrition store or any type of uh, supplement place, you would look inside there, and it's it just looks like powdered sugar. And it's odorless. It's virtually tasteless. But one of the things that we do know is that most of the research shows that it's, a, that it's actually pretty effective, especially when involved in high-intensity training, like sprint training, for instance. Um, now, now, this has been around for a good 20 years. Um, 
my guess is, is this fair, John? That would you say, other than protein based beverages and bars and and so forth, th- this is the maybe the one that comes up the most. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that there is there's a performance value. It will bump up your ability to gain lean mass, to reduce fat mass, and just to be a little bit stronger. It's 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 not a significant <clears throat> excuse me. It's not a significant bump, but it's certainly enough to to notice. And I think when performance is important, particularly if you're an athlete, that little bump can mean a lot. So, sure. yeah, it has value for sure. Now, I would say it's lost a little of its steam. I think that uh, 10 years ago, for sure, it's a little yeah. bigger than it is today. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to this. Uh, I'm wondering why it's lost a little bit of steam. I think a lot of supplements have kind of lost a lot of steam because I think the word is out now that there's – there's so much non-regulation yeah. that people feel like it's it's probably better to kind of stay natural and organic. And that's a great point. This is one of the things uh, the government likes to step in on these products or on products in in really two instances when they're pharmaceutical prescription based drugs and when it's meat. Right. Other than that, we it's have kind of hands off. For oh yeah. In, yeah. Unless they hear people are getting sick or right. even or especially dying, right. they generally don't step in. So we could always make John and John's creatine product and just put powdered sugar in there. Yeah, and you got to think about it for that bump. For that bump, is it worth the risk? You know, I mean, and the cost. And the cost, absolutely. Yeah. How much pretty... do, you, do you remember? What, what's the? I want to say for a thirty day supply, it's it's going to be in excess of twenty five bucks. Oh, it's for... higher than that. I think yeah. it's closer to fifty. Well, it depends on if you have a gallon a day. Or yeah, right? and if you have a you know a deal going with. <laughs> With the supplement provider. Well, let's talk about uh, um, another one. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, Troy, let's um, mention our social media info. Yeah, Doc. Uh, our social media info, you could tweet us at woo, that's W-U, Fitness Doctor, or for sure be, be or for sure check out our page on Facebook at woo, Fitness Doctor. And as always, feel free to email, email us at woo, Fitness Doctor at wingate.edu. So let me get this straight. We have a Twitter account, a right. Facebook page, and an email. Yeah. That this has got to be unheard of, right? This has got to be unheard of in the uh, in the world. And you have a wife with a cell phone. So that's <laughs> also I've heard of, of those too. They're, they're <laughs> terrific little devices. Um, okay, let's let's talk about what, what I would think is clearly for the last 20 years is the biggest seller of all uh, supplements involving uh, athletics or working out just in general. Our protein. protein. Yeah. yeah, and let's talk a little bit about that. First of all, most of the products are called whey protein, and the other type of protein that is sold is called soy protein. So just a little bit of PE 101 here. Uh, whey protein is an animal product. It primarily comes from the protein aspect of milk. It's usually in powder form, and then, of course, it's always flavored, vanilla, strawberry, chocolate, and you mix it with water or milk, and you have anywhere between two and 500 calories of primarily protein. Mm-hmm. And then the other sources are uh, uh, bars. And um, what else would there be? What other form? Uh, uh, Powder is the most common, I think, and that's what people kind of use uh, uh, in the kitchens to make all kinds of and know, then of course there's, rich. And then there's the drinks, right? In other words, the protein, the, the beverage has been added or the liquid right. has been added right. for them. And then on the other Pretty side much. of the coin, there's soy Protein, and of course, this comes directly from a plant. There's half of the farms here in North Carolina, I think, are growing soy. And and the one that's clearly more popular and not as expensive is the, the whey protein. Mm-hmm. And and uh, you probably would agree with me that there's not only the athletes, but non-athletes take this for a couple reasons. What would, what would be some of those reasons, John, that people take um, protein supplements? Well, I mean, uh, for an athlete, a lot of times it's about uh, muscle tissue repair. Um, you know, when you train hard, you play hard, uh, it's necessary to get all those amino acids and that's a quick way to do it. This, the, 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 the magic is when you, when you drink it and when you eat it, there's a, an optimal window that not a lot of people well, let's know talk, about. Let's talk about that. When, when um, now, there's a lot of research actually out there. Right. And in fact, this is relatively new. People were trying to figure out, okay, if this is good for us to take in protein as a result of working out, maybe directly after the workout is best. Right. Right. And, and uh, um, you probably have read some of the same research I have, sure. and that most of it shows that if it's within a couple hours after the actual workout, muscle yeah, repair you, will be at its optimum. Even less. I mean, 30 to 60 minutes, you know, and then the, and then the window starts closing, you know, up to a couple hours. Interesting. Um, but the other thing that I read a lot about and have been to conferences about is that the uh, 
you know, it's not about getting a big dose of it anywhere in the day. Really, it's the, the best way to optimally absorb protein that you buy. <laughs> if you're going to spend that money, you might as well do it right, is that you take in a little bit all day long. That's right. That's that's what the science is saying is the best way to take it in. That's right. Um, and and uh, I, I think some of the reason that even people who don't work out on a regular basis, in fact, um, there's actually quite a few people. And, and one of the reasons that they do it, or a couple of reasons why they do that, is simply because it saves them time. They don't have to cook anything. And money is probably ultimately less. In other words, they see the uh, the cost of in the time of cooking, say, a chicken or a chicken breast sure. or something along those lines. And this is literally just a, a quick fix. Yeah, people have gotten away from what it's called, which is supplement, it's which right. is meant to, to add to an already uh, you know decent nutritional plan. Instead um, of be the meal, it should be. Instead of being the nutrition plan. Yeah, yeah right. it's become the meal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it's convenient. I mean, oh, yeah. it's and, real convenient. Um, in fact, uh, we should change the three letters – in USA to uh, USCA, you know, United States of Convenient America. I mean, that's, that's yeah, exactly. we. If, if you create something that makes something more convenient, we're all about that, and that's a really good example. Sure. And and ultimately, we're probably not eating as well. Right. right. Absolutely. You'll get in a big. A lot of people getting a big overdose of of of, uh, of protein because again, back to what you said. You know, if a little's good, more's better. More's got to be better. Yeah. And um, you know, frankly, you're going to end up with very expensive urine at the end of the day. <laughs> now, uh, one of the things that uh, um, about one of the things about uh, um, protein that people also get kind of caught up in is um, they think it's purely protein, and the fact is yeah, it's... that by itself it it uh, it wouldn't taste very good. No, so there are fillers and flavorings, and yeah, if you if you look at the label, and oftentimes you can't because it's not always available, but you'll want to see the, the label. Yeah, take a good look at that, Troy. Doc, you know what that means? Somebody just tweeted in. I have at bodybuilder26. His question of the day is, why so many diets tell you to avoid carbs? Why do so many diets tell you to avoid carbs? Yeah, that's, um, uh, th- that is the question revolving or involving diet and supplements in the last 10 years, I'd say, maybe, maybe even 15. The primary reason is it has to do with what is called our blood sugar levels. Ours in this country are astronomically high. And when somebody came across the fact that this harms our body's ability to burn fat and, and ultimately uh, increases our, our uh, chances of gaining weight, people started jumping on, we need more protein. And, of course, it, it, you know, research is pretty clear on that, that it lessens um, the blood glucose levels and it's ultimately – um, going to kind of stabilize our blood but sugar. But the levels. protein doesn't energize your body. That's right. And if you're going to work out or you're going to compete, you got to have carbohydrates. No, uh, no the doubt question about is it. the type of carbohydrate. That's what people kind of. It's unfortunate. Understand. Carbs have been kind of considered a four letter word, and they don't deserve that. Absolutely. So we're going to wrap up the show at this point. I want to thank John Ware for being here. I want to thank uh, uh, producer Troy over there, who uh, this show actually wouldn't run without him. And um, uh, we we have some research based on creatine monohydrate. And uh, we're going to post that, right? right yeah. Trying. Like I said before, be sure to check out our Facebook page and our t- Twitter page. Both articles from the previous show will be up there. If you guys want to know more, check it out. Okay, good stuff. So uh, let's uh, let's wrap up at this point. And uh, I, I want to, um, again, thank my guest, John Ware. You bet. And remember, uh, we don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. Uh, and join us again here on The Fitness Doctor, ESPN Radio.